It was an adventure strip. Comedy was what cartoons did. No one had ever done a serious cartoon. Each one is written, edited, performed, directed, scored, and lit as if it was actually happening. Everything that they did in those cartoons is stuff that we're still building on. So much of the Superman mythos is in those cartoons. I think those, more than anything, establish Superman as the icon he is today. My father was uh, a pioneer in uh, animation and a great innovator, great artist, and really gave cartoons the movement and flexibility that we see today. I think then, as now, you have your A-list animation studios and, and your B, and uh, at the time, I think that, you know, you had Disney, of course, was always the, the tops. Uh, but the Fleischers were number two, really, in the, in, you know, throughout the 30s, uh, with the Warner's cartoons coming up very fast. The Fleischer studio consisted of Max as the producer and his brother Dave, the director, and uh, another brother uh, was in the sound department and the music department, and they had brothers all over. Max Fleischer was a cartoonist in the early part of the 20th century, and he also liked to invent things. He was an inventor. And in fact, at one point, he was the uh, art editor of Popular Science magazine. So when he got wind of animation, which of course in the, in the uh, early teens was in a very crude beginning stage, um, it seemed to be a perfect marriage of all of his interests, of the, of the science, the technology, and, and the art, and the cartooning. It wasn't just cartooning, it was using mechanics and technology to make cartoons move. As the studio developed, Max let his focus be the technical aspects of the animation. After uh, a cartoon was finished, Max would often screen the film, and Max would say, well, now, you know, boys, you could have done this here, and the animators looked upon him as a father figure, you know, whose advice they really valued. Max, of course, was a perfect gentleman all the time. I never heard him raise his voice. And they were a very talented family, each one of them. Dave, I consider him the best gag man I ever knew. Dave Fleischer really enjoyed uh, the, the storytelling aspects, and as director, would discuss ideas and gags, so uh, the two were actually a perfect match. Max came up with this idea, which was, he thought, a cheaper way to make cartoons, which would be uh, to photograph live action and then trace over it. He invented a machine called the rotoscope, which is still in use in every special effects house in the world. And uh, that made a complete change in the look of animation. He used it to make his first series of cartoons, Coco the Clown, and that put him in business. He actually had a cartoon series in movie theaters uh, out of the ink well. The Clown appeared as a cartoon along with my father, who was uh, live, live action. And the two played together and had adventures together. But his most popular creation is uh, Betty Boop, and Betty Boop still going strong. He produced the Popeyes. He brought uh, Popeye from the comic strip onto the screen, where the character became even more popular than it did as a, as a, as a comic strip cartoon. The Fleischers felt like they were doing stuff that, that they lived <laughs> or that they saw in the streets. It had more of like a vaudevillian or, or burlesque kind of quality to it. They were really earthy and street. They didn't have college degrees. These guys came from the city, from the Bronx, and they had city humor. And the Popeye cartoons and the Betty Boop cartoons reflect this New York City uh, sense of humor which the guys out on the West Coast, uh, the Looney Tunes guys and, and the Disney guys, they were all uh, highbrow. You know, Lois, the old island looks just as good as ever. That's right, Clark, thanks to Superman. Popeye was, of course, adapted from a comic strip, and that was working for them. And uh, the biggest comic strip to come out of the late 30s was Superman. Paramount got Superman and gave it to the Fleischer studio. The Fleischers didn't want to do the Superman cartoons. The story that Dave told was that to dissuade Paramount from the difficulty of doing such a project, he asked them for an enormous amount of money. They knew it would be a huge challenge, and they didn't want to do it. And Dave outright, no, I, let's not do this. 
So he threw a number at Paramount that he never thought they would accept. And, and Paramount went, okay, let's do it. I guess they realized that Superman was that powerful and that, that, that big a presence because they were really gambling on the success of Superman. You know, they were very, very expensive cartoons for the day. They were, they were doing things that nobody had ever really done before in cartoons. There was a lot of movement and crowd scenes and, and vehicles, you know, crashing into each other and buildings toppling over and it all had to look real. When the Fleischer brothers started doing Superman, they were faced with the challenge of not only animating a, a character that was very popular in the comics, but also keeping it very true to that world, which was a, a serious world. The Superman comics had only been out for a few years at the time they did the cartoons. It looks very, very realistic and very, very believable. Superman! Are you all right? Yes, for the moment, but... The designs of the characters, Lois and, and Clark and Superman himself, they're all very, very faithful to the uh, the, the look that, uh, that Siegel and Schuster came up with for the comic. They also had to come up with a style back in the 30s. Adventure fiction that was sold on newsstands before comic books was pulp magazines. Magazines that sold adventures, western stories, detective stories, heroic stories like The Spider and The Shadow. And they had these great lurid covers, beautifully painted, of dramatic incidents. And if you look at those pulp covers and you look at the first Superman cartoons, you can see that they were taking that, that feel of the pulp magazine and they were transposing it to the animated cartoon. The backgrounds in the Superman cartoons were extremely atmospheric. Animation was not a one-man job, you know. We had specialists do different things. We had some very good people helping. The special effects were fantastic. There are no cartoons that have been made since those Superman cartoons that are the equal of that. The look of the cartoons actually anticipates the look of film noir films. They're very, very dark and very, very shadowy and a lot of Dutch angles and, and very dynamic storytelling, which is stuff you take for granted in film noir school. Yes, Doctor. Uh, I, I've been feeling much better lately, but I'll be right over. I'll see you later, Lois. Doctor's orders. Doctor, my eye. The Adventures of Superman radio show began in 1940, I believe, as a syndicated show. And later on, the Mutual Radio Network picked it up. The voices in the animated cartoons included at least two of the principal voices from the radio show. Bud Collier was the voice of Superman, and Joan Alexander was the voice of Lois Lane. Bud Collier was the voice of Superman on the radio and was well known to people as that's how Superman sounds, so they, they got the real Superman to do it. Bob Maxwell, the producer of the show, told them, well, I want you to test it out, see, see if, you know... And they kind of conned him into it because, you know, the pilot sold and, and oh, that's it, you're our guy. The first moment when you see Clark about to transform to Superman and you hear Bud Collier, who was the only guy in the world who could do that, when, when he starts out saying, This looks like a job for Superman. And he just lowers his voice and right away you get a transition. It, it also contributes to the illusion that maybe the people close to him would not recognize that the two are the same person. Uncanny how Superman turns up just when you need him. I didn't even get a chance to thank him. There's a myth that they came up with the, the look up in the sky, but that's actually from the radio. The look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. It's like from the first radio show. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. That appears to be invented in the cartoons. In the comic, he was always seen to leap. You don't see anything moving in a comic book or on radio. You know, it's in your mind, you know. Somebody can leap and it sounds great. It sounds like he's, oh, look, listen. But he's leaping, like, and it looks ridiculous. It looks really stupid. And they realize, okay, we gotta stop this. They beg DC, can we make him fly? And they're like, yeah, sure, fine. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. And so that was, adopted in the comics because people expected it. Of course Superman can fly, look, he just did. So now he can fly. I don't believe it, he is human. An unsung genius of the Fleischer cartoons was the musician, Sammy Timberg. The soundtrack to that first cartoon in particular, Superman, is one of the greatest musical soundtracks. And in most of the Fleischer cartoons, it's carried a lot by the actions of the characters, the motivations, of the plot and the music. The 
Superman cartoons, like all Hollywood cartoons back in the 1940s and 30s, were shown to all audiences in movie theaters. Cartoons were the most popular part of the program outside of the feature. When you went to see a funny cartoon like a Looney Tune or a Columbia cartoon, one of the others, you were looking at it sort of like an animated version of the Sunday Funnies. Most theatrical cartoons at that time were more adult fare than strictly children's fare. These cartoons were very prestigious. Paramount made movie posters for them. They had advertising. They made a trailer. Nobody ever made a trailer for a short subject. They didn't do that, but they did it for Superman. This was a big deal. With their robots and their futuristic uh, settings and themes and some of them, it's obvious that they would then inspire you know, a whole range of cartoons to come in the future. <laughs> Theatrical cartoons for years and years and decades and decades would, were simply cloning Disney. They were just trying to be another Disney film. So it really took the guys at Warner Brothers in the 90s to pitch doing a Batman cartoon in the style of these old Superman cartoons. With the Batman show, you could see quite an influence. When we started doing the Batman animated series, I was actually going to go with something a little bit brighter, gaudier, and a little bit more weird and stylized. But my boss at the time suggested that we look at the Flash of Superman cartoons again. I think a lot of filmmakers today look at look back at those and go, that's 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 pretty impressive. I know that when we did the Superman and Batman cartoons that were animation in the 90s, those were a definite inspiration to us because we would look at them for staging and for pacing and for the idea of telling a superhero story without much dialogue. Superman cartoons were labors of love. They were light years away from even the Disney cartoons. To Paramount, they were probably the closest thing they could do to producing a live action Superman series. They are just amazing to look at. No matter how much money we spend today, we're still never gonna quite top that magic. Fleischer's marched to a different drummer. And really, only the Fleischer's could have done the Superman cartoons and they were the perfect studio to get that opportunity. I think that for people who've never seen the cartoons before, they'll be like a buried treasure. This is some of the coolest Superman action I've ever seen because they were groundbreaking in their day. They're a triumph of, of design and animation and music. They uh, stand head and shoulders over most everything else ever done in animated adventure.